Almost 400 years ago, in the year 1620, a group of Puritan separatists, or as we know them, the Pilgrims, made a dangerous two-month voyage across the Atlantic Ocean on a ship called the Mayflower. These brave souls founded Plymouth Colony, which holds a special role in American history. A large proportion of the citizens of Plymouth were fleeing religious persecution and searching for a place to worship as they saw fit. Only 200 years later, in 1818, another group of brave souls came together in a small western New York town determined to fellowship and worship the Lord together. This is the story of 200 years of history of the Baptist Church of Perry. What exactly did our church founders face 200 years ago? To answer that question, we need to see what was happening in the country before 1818. Before the Americas were discovered by Europeans, we know that many different tribes of Native American peoples lived all throughout North and South America. Ancient dwellings, as well as stone tools and arrowheads or points, have all been found, even right here in the fields of Perry, New York. Before Western New York State was settled by the white people, it too was Indian Territory. Specifically, six different nations of peoples, together called the Haudenosaunee, or the Iroquois, lived here. One of those nations was the Senecas. Captured by Shawnee warriors in 1758 at the age of 15, Mary Jemison, later known as the White Woman of the Genesee, was taken from her Pennsylvania home, most of her family killed, then sold to two Seneca sisters. The Senecas treated Mary as family, and she lived peaceably among them here in the area we now know as Letcher State Park. New England was becoming crowded in the late 18th century, and men saw the opportunity to buy the land west of Massachusetts, land owned by the Iroquois. Starting in 1788, various land deals occurred. Phelps and Gorham, Robert Morris, the Holland Land Company, and others bought land and in 1797, at the Treaty of Big Tree, Robert Morris obtained title to all the lands west of the Genesee held by the Iroquois. This deal was not good for the Indians, but it did open the door for settlers to come. Mary Jemison would no longer be the only white person living here. The first permanent settler in Perry was Samuel Gates, who came in 1808 from Connecticut, saw the beautiful land, and built a cabin on the hill overlooking the northwest end of Silver Lake. He raised the first crop of wheat, set out the first orchard in Perry, and his daughter Nancy was the first white child born in the town. Settlement was slow at first. Life was hard on the frontier, and they faced many obstacles. The history books tell us that animals were very plentiful in western New York. Panthers, bears, rattlesnakes, and wolves, to name a few. Pioneers had to create their own roads through the forests, bringing with them a limited supply of furniture, animals, and tools. With little or no nails, they had to make simple log cabins at first. These pioneers had none of the conveniences we have and didn't even have things common at that time in populated areas. There were no grocery or clothing stores, no lumber mills, no shoemakers, no blacksmiths, no churches. They of course had no electricity. Everything had to be made by hand. By the end of 1811, there were only 17 families in town. That's not many. This is actually a photo of a Mrs. Brat who was a member here at the church. By 1812, settlers came in more quickly. Many of the people coming here were from New England. The War of 1812 was in progress, and many chose to stop here rather than go near the frontier out west. Schoolhouses, sawmills, and a few other businesses were quickly being established, and the first religious service held in the town of Perry was by a Baptist minister, a Reverend Mr. Herrick in 1813 at Perry Center. He paved the way for a visit the following year from two missionaries who would establish the Congregational Church in Perry Center. 
It was around the same time in 1814 that the town of Perry was established. Many of the early settlers were Baptists. Some would attend services at the Middlebury Church in Wyoming, some with the Congregational Church in Perry Center, until finally in September 1816, they came together to be known as the First Baptist Society of Perry. In October of 1818, the Society adopted Articles of Faith and a Church Covenant, and on November 5, 1818, churches at Leicester, Warsaw, and Gainesville extended the hand of fellowship and publicly recognized it as a Church of Christ. Reverend Wisner was the first pastor, and the records are all sure to mention my third cousin five times removed, Samuel Waldo, who was chosen as the first clerk. With the completion of the Erie Canal in 1825, the little struggling church finally saw growth, and its membership jumped from 33 that year to 117 just a few years later. All this time, services were held in homes or sometimes in the village schoolhouse. In a special history of the church published in the Perry Herald in 1897, we read, during the years 1827 to 1828, special meetings were held by the pastor during which the Holy Spirit came upon the people and the church was greatly strengthened and built up. Even with no church building, these pioneering church founders proved that the church is not defined by a building. Rather, it is the coming together of those who have put their faith in Jesus. Finally, in 1830, the same year that the village of Perry was incorporated, a meeting house was built, costing $3,000. The records tell us that the pews were auctioned off to the highest bidders, and the purchaser, or his heirs or assigns, would be privileged to retain ownership forever. We'll talk about those pews a little later. Perry had quite a few different names up to this point, first called Slabtown, then Shacksburg, Beachville, Columbia, and Nineveh. Ouch! But thanks to Commodore Oliver Hazard Perry, who was the hero of the Battle of Lake Erie, Perry was saved from being a town of Ninevites. Do you realize that you have all walked on the same floors as our 21st President of the United States? Yes, you have. In 1833, President Arthur, then a boy of only four years old, came to Perry with his family, where his father served as our pastor until 1837. In 1837, Elon Galusha became pastor. It is written in history that he was an eloquent expounder of God's truth, and while pastor, he traveled to England as a representative of the American Anti-Slavery Society. He served as a delegate at the London Anti-Slavery Convention of 1840. His image can be found in this painting of the convention by artist Robert Hayden. What is quite special about this time in our church history is the fact that out of 13 Wyoming County residents at that time, known to be operators on the Underground Railroad, four of those individuals were not only from Perry, but they were also members of the Baptist Church of Perry. In addition to Galusha, there was Samuel Phoenix, Willard Chapin, and Josiah Andrews. Under the direction of Galusha and these men, the church took a stand against slavery that has never been rescinded. It's still on the books as of today. It states, The brethren now resolved that as a church of Christ, they could not fellowship with slaveholders or their apologists. This stand, of course, was especially meaningful as the church saw slavery abolished at the end of the Civil War. In Lloyd F. Chapman's 1936 History of the Baptist Church of Perry, there is an account of the only time that a subject divided this church. The subject of secret societies, which had been a controversy for many years in the church, finally resulted in the adoption of a resolution in 1877 that membership with secret societies should no longer be a test of membership within the church. 
About 80 of the older and conservative members withdrew their support and a few years later organized into a separate body under the name of the Leicester Street Baptist Church. They continued as separate churches until 1909 when they would come together again and change the name from the First Baptist Church to the Baptist Church of Perry, the name that we hold today. In 1886, the current parsonage was built at a cost of $1,900. The following year, in 1887, the pipe organ, the same one you see to your right at the front as you watch this video, was purchased and installed at a cost of $1,250. It was, of course, installed in the original wood church, the structure that is off to your left. You can see the date 1895 in the flowers over the door to the right. J. H. Hollingsworth was the pastor at that time, so we may be safe to assume it is he sitting at the center, with perhaps his wife sitting to the left. The sanctuary must have smelled sensational with all those flower swags and arrangements. In 1900, a very special project was begun. The original wooden building was moved to the rear of the lot and the cornerstone for the new brick addition was laid on September 25th. Check out those original stained glass windows on the old building. In the record is a long list of some wonderful items that were placed in the cornerstone. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could have a peek inside and perhaps place a few items from the last 100 years in there alongside the old? How exciting that we have an actual time capsule and buried treasure here at church. On July 23, 1901, the new building was finished and dedicated in a special ceremony. The entire building was completed at a cost of $15,000. You couldn't build a small brick house these days for that amount. Remember how we talked about the auctioning off of pews? Well, the members didn't forget either. On May 25, 1901, a meeting was held. A lawyer had been consulted and advised the following. If the erection of a new church edifice was necessary, the pew holders have no claim for compensation or right to a pew in the new building. It went on and concluded with, the church corporation may declare the seats in its edifice to be free or the trustees may do so. Well, guess what? As you can see, seats were declared to be free. In 1918, our past members would have celebrated not only 100 years as a church, but also the end of World War I on November 11th, the 11th month on the 11th day. What a celebration that must have been, even though they had no idea they would have to endure yet another World War to come. And that's only the first 100 years. We have so much more history that we'll have to save it for another video. I hope you enjoyed this look back in time. Stay tuned for thoughts of several of our members, as well as a look back and thoughts from Pastor and Phyllis.